Good morning and welcome to the Old Kirk of Air. A warm welcome to our friends in St Nicholas Parish Church in Preswick and of course to our listeners on the Dial a Sermon service. We begin our worship with Restore, O Lord. of sovereign power come shake the earth again that all may see and come with reverent fear to the living God whose kingdom shall outlast thee restore And in that time, revive the church that bears your name. In your anger, Lord, remember mercy, O living God, whose mercy shall outlast the Let us pray. Almighty and sovereign God, great and wonderful, all-powerful, all-loving, all-good, all-forgiving, once more we make time to worship you. We come to remind ourselves of all you have done, your mighty acts across the years, your coming to our world in Christ, your transforming of countless lives won for him. We come to rejoice in all you are still doing, your faithful love reaching out to all people everywhere, your mercy offering new beginnings, where before there was only despair, your saving purpose constantly being fulfilled. Almighty God, forgive us for losing the sense of all we once had. Forgive us for letting how great you are. Forgive us for bringing you down to our level rather than rising up to yours. Forgive us the smallness of our vision, the feebleness of our worship, the weakness of our faith. Enlarge our vision, deepen our faith, renew our trust, restore our sense of wonder before you. Teach us that you are a great God above all gods, Lord of the nations, sovereign over space and time. And so may we offer to you our worship with glad and grateful hearts. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd now like to invite Sandra Mullen to read our lesson. The reading today is taken from Mark chapter 16, reading from verse 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. 
very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. Amen. Thank you, Sandra. A man was driving along the highway and saw a rabbit hopping down the middle of the road. He swerved to avoid it, but unfortunately the rabbit jumped in front of the car and was struck. The driver, being a sensitive man as well as an animal lover, pulled over to the side of the road and got out to see what had become of the rabbit. Much to his dismay, the rabbit was dead. A woman driving down the road the other way saw the man and pulled over. She stepped out of the car and asked what was wrong. I feel terrible, he explained. I accidentally hit this rabbit and killed it. The woman told the man not to worry. She knew what to do. She went over to her car, pulled out a spray can, walked over to the limp, dead rabbit and sprayed the contents of the can onto the rabbit. Miraculously, the rabbit came to life, jumped up, waved its paw at the two people and hopped down the road. Ten feet away, the rabbit stopped, turned around, waved at the two people again, hopped down the road another ten feet, turned, waved, and hopped another ten feet, and repeated this again and again until it was out of sight. The man was astonished. He couldn't figure out what the substance could be in the woman's spray can. He ran over to her and demanded, what is in your can? What did you spray onto that rabbit? The woman turned the can around so the man could read the label. It said, hairspray, restores life to dead hair, adds permanent wave. One of the most difficult subjects of the Christian faith for many is the subject of miracles. Did Jesus really feed 5,000 people with only two loaves and five fish? Is it true that he walked on water? Could he really have raised Lazarus from the dead? I have never really had a problem with the subject of miracles. You see, if you can believe in a God who made the universe, then things like the virgin birth or resurrection are child's play. But for many, the subject of miracles is a difficult one to come to terms with in this supposedly scientific age. Yet the fact that the majority of scientists would count themselves as Christian doesn't seem to register. So this morning I want to explore the subject of miracles. The miracles recorded in the New Testament cannot be dismissed as the writer's poetic license. We have to accept them and then try to understand them. Or we have to reject them and then try to salvage what we can from our faith. So let's begin by looking at what we mean when we say miracle. We've become very lax in our use of language because we often use the word miracle to describe things that are merely strange or unusual. For example, someone recovering from cancer is deemed miraculous. Now it could be, but it could also be down to the treatment. A company clinches a deal that saves the workforce from redundancy. Is that a miracle or just good business practice? A bomb explodes and no one is injured. Is that a miracle or just luck? And then there's the way that we use the word miracle to describe anything we don't understand. Computers are miraculous. Thomas Hardy, the writer, thought that the telephone was miraculous. For me, the greatest miracle is, how does a thermos flask know how to keep hot things warm and cold things cool? Then there is the poet's view of the world. Often they write about the miracle of day and night, the cycle of nature. But are these things really miracles or can they be explained? If in the Middle Ages you had shown someone a television, they would have regarded it as a miracle. But we can explain it now. If you told a Victorian that one day a man would walk on the moon, he would think of that as being miraculous. But we know how to do it. We've done it. So many of the things that we don't understand today, and therefore might regard as miracles, could well be explained tomorrow. 
and therefore will not be thought of miracles in the future. Let me give you just one example of how knowledge can affect our view of the miraculous. When Lawrence of Arabia brought some of his followers over to the West after the war, they were not staggered by the trains or cars, but by a simple waterfall. To those men whose whole lives were spent in the desert, continuous running water was truly miraculous. So knowledge isn't the whole answer to what makes a miracle. A better idea is to think of a miracle in terms of something that defies human skill to perform and which baffles human wisdom to explain. In other words, something that we can't do and which we can't understand how it happened. For example, we can explain how a television works, but we can't perform or explain how the feeding of the 5,000 took place. Something that defies human skill to perform and which baffles human wisdom to explain. That's a good place to begin. But it doesn't quite catch the whole flavour of what a miracle is about. For that, we must look at the New Testament view of miracles. In John's Gospel, there are two words used to describe the miracles of Jesus. The first word is that used for power. The power in question is that of God's. And therefore, a miracle is the act of God intervening in the world in a powerful way. For example, the flood or Daniel in the lion's den. God intervened and changed the course of creation. Miracles have to do with God showing his power to change the way things are by doing what only God can do. That then rules out much of what we term miraculous because it is something that we can do, but only God can do miracles. The second word used in the New Testament for miracles is the word sign. True miracles show us something of the nature of God. For example, the manna sent to the people of Israel in the desert shows the compassion and generosity of God. Miracles are about pointing out who God is. Therefore, if anything we deem miraculous doesn't tell us something about the nature of God, then it isn't a miracle. Power on its own is neutral. It can be used for good or evil. It is only when we see where the miracle points us that we can decide on who it comes from and whether it really is a miracle. In the New Testament, a miracle is an event that allows us to see into the heart of God and which shows us something of his attitude towards us. But while that might well be an adequate definition that hopefully we could all agree on, it still doesn't solve the problem of, did miracles actually happen? What is the evidence? Let's begin by looking at this suggestions that have been put forward, doubting the validity of the miracles. The first suggestion was that Jesus lived in a time of miracles. It has been claimed that the heathen and pagan followers could easily match and surpass the miracles of Jesus. For example, the Roman Emperor Vespian healed a blind man and a cripple. The Greek Apollonius brought a young bride back from the dead. Some of these miracles are obviously made up. Therefore, it is claimed that the miracles of Jesus have to be suspect also. But it could be just as easily claimed that since this was an age of miracles, that people were ready for miraculous things to happen. They were conditioned to await and accept the miracle. Here was an age when hearts and minds were open to receive the divine. Maybe if we were a little more open to the miraculous, then we would see more miracles happening around us today. I think we miss many wonderful acts of God, simply because we have closed our eyes to the possibility of miracles in 2020. Miracles do happen today, if you have the eyes to see and the heart to believe. And who knows, maybe the church would be a stronger place if we could rediscover a belief in the miraculous. Another accusation that is thrown at the miracle stories in the Gospels is that of exaggeration. The writers added wee bits on to make the stories more compelling, to make Jesus seem even more impressive. For example, in Mark's Gospel, when the women emptied the tomb after the crucifixion, they saw only one angel. But by the time John wrote his account, there were two angels. Both can't be right. One has exaggerated. But what you have to remember is that all the gospel accounts agree on the central facts of the resurrection story. Jesus wasn't in the tomb. He 
had risen. They didn't differ on what really happened. That is, that the resurrection did take place. Plus, if all the accounts had been exact, word for word, then that would probably have led to a charge of collusion. Sir James, James Hope Simpson, a banker, once said that if you ever had two exact signatories, one was a forgery. We have to remember that Mark wrote his gospel some 30 years after Jesus' death. John, around 70 years after his death. The reason that they weren't written earlier is that the disciples believed that the kingdom of God was going to arrive soon. And since the disciples were alive, they didn't need to write anything down. So when they did begin to write things down, little changes were made because their memories of past events had changed. But not the central facts, nor does that change affect the truth that lies at the heart of what occurred. Mark and John may differ on the number of angels, but they agree that Jesus rose from the dead and that he performed many miraculous acts. And that's why we shouldn't doubt it. Exaggeration is no reason to doubt the miracles. The final doubt I want to discuss is possibly the most challenging for Christians. This doubt says that every miracle has a natural explanation. For example, the feeding of the 5,000 resulted from people being embarrassed by the little boy offering his packed lunch. Everyone then chipped in and enough food was found for all. That's a possibility. But what about the time Jesus walked in water? Don't tell me that the fishermen in his group didn't know about any stepping stones just under the surface. Or what about the resurrection? The Roman soldiers knew that Jesus was dead. How do you explain those? The attack of natural explanation just doesn't hold water. We are still left with the fact that Jesus performed deeds that we call miracles. Deeds that defy human skill and human explanation. Deeds that could only be done by God. So what about the positive evidence for miracles? Well, we've already looked briefly at Mark's account and found that even although it was written some 30 years after the event, it was still probably accurate in the central details. It has been suggested that it was Mark's mother's house that was used as a meeting place for the early Christians. And so he would have heard all the stories of Jesus. Add to that the fact that storytelling in those days was far more important and reliable than the written word. Stories were told and retold word for word for centuries, without errors to the substance. And for a mere 30 years did not mean that accurate accounts of what Jesus did weren't available to be written down. On top of that, Mark was Peter's biographer. His gospel is an eyewitness account of what actually happened. So unless you're prepared to denounce the whole of the Bible as fake and forgery, then the evidence of Mark points to the fact that Jesus performed miracles. The second piece of evidence that supports our belief that Jesus did in fact do the things recorded in the New Testament is that the Jewish authorities never denied that he did miraculous things. Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, came to Jesus with the words, No one can do the things you do unless God is with you. So even the Jews recognised that Jesus could do miracles. If his sworn enemies didn't doubt his ability to do such things, should we? And finally, we have the evidence that comes from out with the disciples and the authors of the New Testament. Quadratus was a Roman who wrote one of the first defences of the Christian faith. He wrote to the Roman authorities defending the Christians, saying that the people healed by Jesus were still alive and could be produced as evidence. Now, when you were writing to the Roman government, you had to be sure of your facts, because there is no question that they would have investigated such claims. And if they found them untrue, then they would have made an example of Quadratus. Here again is powerful evidence suggesting that however impossible we might think miracles to be, they happened. And finally, the evidence that suggests the miracles happens came from Jesus himself. The only difference between Jesus and you and I is that he was sinless. Now, if we are capable of loving acts and of using God's power, then surely the one that is sinless is capable of even greater acts of power and love. Jesus was sinless, and because of that, he was able to acquire power that is beyond our reach. He was able to use that power for good and not for evil. Jesus was sinless, and because he was sinless, he was able to perform miracles that we cannot. All his miracles demonstrate the power of God, 
And they point us to the very character of God's heart. Jesus is the best proof available that miracles did happen. The choice we're left with today is to believe the evidence that is before us about miracles and then try to understand what they tell us about God. Or we can reject them as impossible and irrational, which leaves us with no choice but to junk everything tainted with miracles. And that includes junking Jesus as well. If you reject the miracles, then you really have nothing left to hold on to in the Christian faith. Because denying them is to see Jesus and his followers as frauds and charlatans, and who would want to follow such people? But if you accept the miracles did happen, then you must go on and answer the questions raised by them. What do they tell us about God? What do they tell us about the nature of God? And most important of all, why do some miracles happen today and others don't? Accepting the miracles happens is happening is only the beginning of the story, not the end. How are you going to go? Amen. Brian McEnroy is now going to lead us in prayer. Our praise, prayers for other people. Let us pray. Lord of love and mercy, we thank you for the welcome that you offer us, the generosity that you extend to us, and the peace that you make with us. May we never forget your everlasting love for us, the mercy you show to us, and your never-ending compassion for us. Father God, as we approach summer breaks of various kinds, despite the restrictions because of COVID, we pray for ourselves and our world. We thank you for the luxury of a holiday, for refreshment and rest from work, and we pray for our minister and his family as they look forward to a well-reserved break. We pray for those whose lives are made harder and busier by long summer holidays, and for those without the luxury of a holiday at all. God of love and compassion, we pray for all who seek to make a difference in the lives of others. Be with carers and counsellors, medics and mediators, those with listening ears and those with caring hands. God of justice and peace, we pray for all who seek to challenge injustices and stand up for what is right. Be with the politician and the protester, the activists and the pacifist, the vocal and the silent. We think of those children and young people who may experience loneliness during the holidays due to losing a parent through death or family breakup. Please be their God of comfort during the summer holidays. Comfort their hearts and let your hand be upon them. Almighty and merciful God, we remember before you all poor and neglected persons. It would be easy for us to forget the homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us by our actions to heal those who are broken in body or spirit and to turn their sorrow into joy. As we go out into a new week at the start of the summer holidays, help us to follow Jesus' example by looking out for those who feel marginalised, who cannot find peace and hope, who believe that they have little or nothing to offer, who seem to be overwhelmed by life itself. Help us to widen our own horizons, to make space for the stranger, to watch out for those who feel invisible, to give time to the outsider, to talk to the person facing silence. Father, in this moment of silence, we bring before you those known to us who are in need of your special help at this time, whether through illness or bereavement. We ask them that you hold your, in your loving arms and trust in you that all will be well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, knowing that you always hear our prayers and always answer them. Amen. Thank you, Brian. And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. God bless and keep safe. We close with Shine, Jesus Shine.